give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning? Do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. To even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. Uh, Congress is uh, considering pulling the plug on the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which is the success of Don't the get me started. No, I want to get you started. This is the, the, the successor to the Hubble, and they say it can peer into the universe and maybe see the moment when the universe was born. I don't even know how that happens. Uh, but it costs $6.8 billion. Well, first of all, let's clarify what's, what the NASA budget is. The bank bailout, that sum of money could reach Venus. <laughs> That sum of money is greater than the entire 50-year running budget of NASA. Wow. And so when someone says, we don't have enough money for this space probe, I'm asking, no, it's not that you don't have enough money. It's that the distribution of money that you're spending is warped in some way that you are removing the only thing that gives people something to dream about tomorrow. Do you, you remember the 60s? You didn't, you didn't have to go more than a week before there's an article in, 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 in Life magazine, the, the, the home of tomorrow, the city of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow. All that ended in the, in, in the 1970s. After we stopped going to the moon, it all ended. We stopped dreaming. And so I worry that decisions that Congress makes doesn't factor in the consequences of those decisions on tomorrow. Tomorrow's gone. You know what? We, we the, playing, the playing for tomorrow, metaphoric tomorrow, not the literal tomorrow. They're playing for the quarterly report. They're playing for the next election cycle. And that is mortgaging the actual future of this nation. The rest of the, country, the, rest of the world is going to pass it by. If, if NASA weren't around, yes. what would happen to our universe? Well, I can tell you this. If NASA weren't here, we would know a lot less about the universe. And we would be intellectually impoverished by that fact. Because I enjoy knowing where we are, where we came from, 
and where we're going. And those questions are answered from space. To know how Earth got here, how the sun got here, what the future of Earth will be, what the future of our sun will be. Will we need to leave Earth and find another planet? All of that comes to us from the discoveries of a space program. Much of those discoveries have come from NASA. So it's not that the universe would be different if NASA never existed. It's that we would be different in a way that I don't even want to think about. So we wouldn't, so we wouldn't know a single thing about the universe. Yeah, we would be... We wouldn't know a single thing about the universe. We'd just be rummaging on Earth's surface thinking that our solutions to all our problems come from looking down rather than from looking up. Anyway, um, I read a book, Constellation of Philosophy. The main guy, Boethius, is condemned to death. He has everything taken from him. All he has is his reason and his sense of self. Not even that. But he attempts to console himself to this execution by reasoning that the world has order, that there is something that keeps things together. And he uses his reason to try and get to the root of why he should be at peace at death. The problem is, his source of origin is a belief in God. What would you do? Well, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question. I do know that uh, if he's about to be executed... Uh, How about you are about to be executed? Oh, I'm about to be executed. You have nothing except your knowledge and your, your knowledge of science, your experience. I would request that my body in death be buried, not cremated, so that the energy content contained within it, gets returned to the earth so that flora and fauna can dine upon it just as I have dined upon flora and fauna throughout my life. If you deny climate change, what do you say to them? Uh, the, I, in a free country, which at least we believe, we, we tell ourselves we live in a free country, uh, I, don't, I don't care what you believe. You believe whatever you want. The problem comes about is if you are in denial of an emergent scientific truth and you wield power over legislation. That's a recipe for disaster. The person on the street doesn't care about climate change or doesn't, you know, maybe I will have a conversation, but I'm not going to lose sleep over that. It's when someone, an elected official, stands in denial of climate change, something that scientists have been telling them now for decades, and they're going to create legislation in response to that. What, that is the end of an informed democracy. The end. I love when they say, I don't know anything about it, but... But it's not true. <laughs> I don't know yeah. anything, but yeah. it's not and, true. And so, by the way, I don't beat politicians over the head. You'll never see me arguing with a politician. You know why? Because politicians, representatives, senators, they are duly elected by a community of people, the electorate. So if they want to say the Earth is 6,000 years old, it's probably because their electorate thinks so. And so as an educator, my task is to educate the electorate so that they could then vote people into office who can make sensible legislative decisions that can affect us all and not derive from their personal private belief system. There's no tablet in the sky that said it had to be simple to end up being complex. It's just a remarkable fact about the universe. So why not celebrate it? The fact that pi, pi, that, that pi, pi, right? Let's, let's say the numbers together. 3.14592. 3. Well, we got a few. That's a, that is a nerd fact. We got a deep thing going on over there. Not I bad, thought. not bad. The fact that you take a circle of any size, a circle the size of the universe itself, and divide it by its own radius, and you get that number, that's beautiful. I have to pause, and I, I get misty thinking of this. <laughs> it's not, that's, that's just, that's another one, another one, that the atoms and molecules in your body are traceable to the crucibles in the centers of stars that manufacture these elements over its lifespan. 
went unstable on death, exploding its enriched guts across the galaxy, scattering it into gas clouds that would ultimately collapse and make a star and have the right ingredients to make planets and people. Which means we are part of this universe. As I've said many times, and this is, goes back, the, the, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. That is a profound concept. And it was, I think it's the greatest gift that astrophysics gave culture in the 20th century.